Hi guys, Sam from Outfit Makes. Happy Sunday. Hope you're having a wonderful weekend. So, hi to all my returners and hi to any newbies. All the newbies, I hope you stick around for a while. And if you are new here, just to let you know that on a Saturday and a Sunday, I read you stories from this book, which is Grimm's Complete Fairy Tales. And there is a whole playlist on my channel should you wish to hear the stories you may have missed. And I also did uh, The Wizard of Oz, which has its own separate playlist as well. So before we begin, my usual little disclaimer, these stories, stories? These stories were written a very, very long time ago. They are the words of the authors. Nothing in these am I saying I condone or I agree or that I share that viewpoint. They can be a little dark. They can be a little twisted. I am literally just reading you the words off of the pages, guys, because I find it fascinating um, what literature was around so long ago. So... Let's get settled in and comfortable and start today's stories. So we are starting today on story 71 and it is how six men got on in the world. There was once a man who understood all kinds of arts. He served in war and behaved well and bravely. But when the war was over, he received his dismissal and three farthings for his expenses on the way. Stop! said he. I shall not be content with this. If I can only meet with the right people, the king will have yet to give me all the treasure of the country. Then, full of anger, he went into the forest and saw a man standing there who had plucked up six trees as if they were blades of corn. He said to him, will you be my servant and go with me? Yes, he answered, but first I will take this little bundle of sticks home to my mother. And he took one of the trees and wrapped it round the five others, lifted the bundle on his back and carried it away. Then he returned and went with his master, who said, We too ought to be able to get through the world very well. And when they had walked on for a short while, they found a hunter who was kneeling, had shouldered his gun and was about to fire. The master said to him, Hunter, what are you going to shoot? He answered, Two miles from here, a fly is sitting on the branch of an oak tree and I want to shoot its left eye out. Oh, come with me, said the man. If we three are together, we certainly ought to be able to get on in the world. The hunter was ready and went with him, and they came to seven windmills, whose sails were turning round with great speed, and yet no wind was blowing, either on the right or the left, and no leaf was stirring. Then said the man, I know not what is driving the windmills, not a breath of air is stirring, and he went onwards with his servants. And when they had walked two miles, they saw a man sitting on a tree who was shutting one nostril and blowing out of the other. Good gracious, what are you doing up there? He answered, two miles from here are seven windmills. Look, I am blowing them till they turn round. Oh, come with me, said the man. If we four are together, we shall carry the whole world before us. Then the blower came down and went with him. And after a while, they saw a man who was standing on one leg and had taken off the other and laid it beside him. Then the master said, you have arranged things very comfortably to have a rest. I am a runner, he replied, and to stop myself running far too fast, I have taken off one of my legs, for if I run with both, I go quicker than any bird can fly. Oh, go with me. If we five are together, we shall carry the whole world before us. So he went with them, and it was not long before they met a man who wore a cap, but had put it over just one ear. Then the master said to him, Gracefully, gracefully, don't stick your cap on one ear. You look just like a tomfool. I must not wear it otherwise, said he, for if I set my hat straight, a terrible frost comes on and all the birds in the air are frozen and drop dead on the ground. Oh, come with me, said the master. If we six are together, we can carry the whole world before us. Now the six came to a town where the king had proclaimed that whoever ran a race with his daughter and won the victory should be her husband, but whoever lost it must lose his head. Then the man presented himself and said, I will, however, let my servant run for me. The king replied, then his life also must be staked, so that his head and yours are both set on the victory. When that was settled and made secure, the man buckled the other leg on the runner and said to him, now be nimble and help us to win. It was fixed that the one who was first to bring some water from a far distant well was to be the victor. The runner received a pitcher and the king's daughter won too and they began to run at the same time. 
But in an instant, when the king's daughter had got a very little way, the people who were looking on could see no more of the runner, and it was just as if the wind had whistled by. In a short time, he reached the well, filled his pitcher with water, and turned back. Halfway home, however, he was overcome with fatigue, and set down his pitcher, lay down, and fell asleep. He had, however, made a pillow of a horse's skull which was lying on the ground, in order that he might lie uncomfortably and soon wake up again. In the meantime, the king's daughter, who could also run very well, quite as well as any ordinary mortal can, had reached the well and was hurrying back with her pitcher full of water, and when she saw the runner lying there asleep, she was glad, and said, My rival is delivered over into my hands, emptied his pitcher and ran on. And now all would have been lost if by good luck the hunter had not been standing at the top of the castle and had not seen everything with his sharp eyes. Then, said he, the king's daughter shall, not, shall still not prevail against us, and he loaded his gun and shot so cleverly that he shot the, shot the horse's skull away from under the runner's head without hurting him. Then the runner awoke, leapt up and saw that his pitcher was empty and that the king's daughter was already far in advance. He did not lose heart, however, but ran back to the well with his pitcher, again drew some water, and was at home again ten minutes before the king's daughter. Look, said he, I have barely stretched my legs till now. It did not deserve to be called running before. But it pained the king, and still more his daughter, that she should be carried off by a common disbanded soldier like that. So they took counsel with each other how to get rid of him and his companions. Then said the king to her, I have thought of a way. Don't be afraid. They shall not come back again. And he said to them, You shall now make merry together and eat and drink. And he conducted them to a room which had a floor of iron, and the doors were also of iron, and the windows were guarded with iron bars. There was a table in the room covered with delicious food, and the king said to them, Go in and enjoy yourselves. And when they were inside, he ordered the doors to be shut and bolted. Then he sent for the cook and commanded him to make a fire under the room until the iron became red hot. This the cook did and the six who were sitting at the table began to feel quite warm and they thought the heat was caused by the food. But as it became still greater and they wanted to get out and found that the doors and windows were bolted, they became aware that the king must have an evil intention and wanted to suffocate them. He shall not succeed, however, said the one with the cap. I will cause a frost to come that shall make the fire feel ashamed and creep away. Then he put his cap on straight and immediately there came such a frost that all heat disappeared and the food on the dishes began to freeze. When an hour or two had passed by and the king believed that they had perished in the heat, he had the doors opened to see them himself. But when the doors were opened, all six were standing there alive and well and said that they should very much like to get out to warm themselves for the very food was fast frozen to the dishes with the cold. Then, full of anger, the king went down to the cook, scolded him and asked why he had not done what he had been ordered to do. But the cook replied, there is heat enough there, just look yourself. Then the king saw that a fierce fire was burning under the iron room and perceived that there was no getting the better of the six in this way. Again, the king considered how to get rid of his unpleasant guests and had their ch chief brought and said, If you will take gold and renounce my daughter, you shall have as much as you will. Oh yes, Lord King, he answered, give me as much as my servant can carry on, and I will not ask for your daughter. At this the king was satisfied and the other continued, In fourteen days I will come and fetch it. Then he summoned together all the tailors in the whole kingdom and they were to sit for fourteen days and sew a sack. And when it was ready, the strong one who could tear up trees had to take it on his back and go with it to the king. Then said the king, Who can that strong fellow be who is carrying a bundle of linen on his back that is as big as a house? And he was alarmed and said, What a lot of gold he can carry away. Then he commanded a ton of gold to be brought. It took sixteen of his strongest men to carry it. But the strong one snatched it up in one hand, put it in his sack and said, why don't you bring more at the same time? That hardly covers the bottom. Then, little by little, the king had all his treasure brought there, and the strong one pushed it into the sack, and still the sack was not half full with it. Bring more, cried he, these few crumbs don't fill it. Then seven thousand carts with gold had to be gathered together in the whole kingdom, and the strong one thrust them into his sack with the oxen still harnessed to them. I will not look too closely, said he, but will just take what comes so long as the sack is full. When all that was inside, there was still room for a great deal more. Then he said, 
I will just make an end of this. I will tie up the sack even though it is not full. So he took it on his back and went away with his comrades. When the king now saw how one single man was carrying away the entire wealth of the country, he became enraged and bade his horsemen mount and pursue the six and ordered them to take the sack away from the strong one. Two regiments speedily overtook the six and called out, You are prisoners, put down the sack with the gold or you will all be cut to pieces. What say you, cried the blower, that we are prisoners? Rather than that should happen, all of you shall dance about in the air. And he closed one nostril and with the other blew on the two regiments. Then they were driven away from each other and carried into the blue sky over all the mountains, one here, the other there. One sergeant cried for mercy. He had nine wounds and was a brave fellow who did not deserve ill treatment. The blower stopped a little so that he came down without injury and then the blower said to him, Now go home to your king and tell him he had better send some more horsemen and I will blow them all into the air. When the king was informed of this, he said, Let the rascals go, they have the best of it. Then the six carried the riches home, divided it amongst them and lived in content until their death. Okay, story 72, which is the wolf and the man. Once on a time, the fox was talking to the wolf about the strength of man, how no animal could withstand him and how all were obliged to employ cunning in order to preserve themselves from him. Then the wolf answered, if I had but the chance of seeing a man for once, I would set on him all the same. I can help you do that, said the fox. Come to me early tomorrow morning and I will show you one. The wolf presented himself early and the fox took him out on the road by which the hunters went daily. First came to an old discharged soldier. Is that a man? inquired the wolf. No, answered the fox. That was one. Afterwards came a little boy who was going to school. Is that a man? No, that is going to be one. At length came a hunter with his double-barrelled gun at his back and knife by his side. Said the fox to the wolf, Look, there comes a man, you must attack him, but I will take myself off to my hole. The wolf then rushed on the man. When the hunter saw him, he said, It is a pity that I have not loaded with a bullet, aimed and fired his small shot in his face. The wolf made a very wry face, but did not let himself be frightened and attacked him again, on which the hunter gave him the second barrel. The wolf swallowed his pain and rushed on the hunter, but he drew out his bright knife and gave him a few cuts with it right and left, so that bleeding everywhere, he ran howling back to the fox. Well, brother wolf, said the fox, how have you got on with man? Ah, replied the wolf, I never imagined the strength of man to be what it is. First he took a stick from his shoulder and blew into it, and then something flew into my face which tickled me terribly. Then he breathed once more into the stick and it flew into my nose like lightning and hail. When I was quite close, he drew a white rib out of his side and he beat me with it till I was all but left lying dead. See what a braggart you are, said the fox. You have overreached yourself. You throw your hatchet so far that you cannot fetch it back again. And that's the end of that one, guys. So the third story for today is story 73 and it's called The Wolf and the Fox. The wolf had the fox with him and whatever the wolf wished that the fox was compelled to do for he was weaker and he would gladly have been rid of his master. It chanced that once as they were going through the forest the wolf said Red Fox get me something to eat or else I will eat you yourself. Then the fox answered I know a farmyard where there are two young lambs if you are inclined. We will fetch one of them. That suited the wolf and they went there and the fox stole the little lamb, took it to the wolf and went away. The wolf devoured it but was not satisfied with one. He wanted the other as well and went to get it. Since, however, he did it so awkwardly, the mother of the little lamb heard him and began to cry out terribly and to bleat so that the farmer came running there. They found the wolf and beat him so mercilessly that he went to the fox limping and howling. You have misled me finely, said he. I wanted to fetch the other lamb and the country folk surprised me and have beaten me to a jelly. The fox replied, why are you such a glutton? Next day they again went into the country and the greedy wolf once more said, Red fox, get me something to eat or I will eat you yourself. Then answered the fox, I know a farmhouse where the wife is baking pancakes tonight. We will get some of them for ourselves. 
They went there and the fox slipped round the house and peeped and sniffed about until he discovered where the dish was and then drew down six pancakes and carried them to the wolf. There is something for you to eat, said he to him and then went his way. The wolf swallowed down the pancakes in an instant and said they make one want more and went back and tore the whole dish down so that it broke in pieces. This made such a great noise that the woman came out and when she saw the wolf she called the people who hurried there and beat him as long as their sticks would hold together till with two lame legs and howling loudly he got back to the fox in the forest. How abominably you have misled me, cried he. The peasants caught me and tanned my skin for me. But the fox replied, why are you such a glutton? On the third day, when they were out together and the wolf could only limp along painfully, he again said, Red fox, get me something to eat or I will eat you yourself. The fox answered, I know a man who has been killing and the salted meat is lying in a barrel in the cellar. We will get that. Said the wolf, I will go when you do that you may help me if I am not able to get away. I am willing, said the fox and showed him the bypaths and ways by which at length they reached the cellar. There was meat in abundance and the wolf attacked it instantly and thought there is plenty of time before I need leave off. The fox liked it also but looked about everywhere and often ran to the hole by which they had come in and tried if his body was still thin enough to slip through it. The wolf said, dear fox, tell me why you are running here and there so much and jumping in and out. I must see that no one is coming, replied the crafty fellow. Don't eat too much. Then said the wolf, I shall not leave until the barrel is empty. In the meantime, the farmer, who had heard the noise of the fox's jumping, came into the cellar. When the fox saw him, he was out of the hole in one bound. The wolf wanted to follow him, but he had made himself so fat with eating that he could no longer get through, but stuck fast. Then came the farmer with a cudgel and struck him dead, but the fox bounded into the forest, glad to be rid of the old glutton. Right, guys, I'm going to leave it there for today. There will, of course, be more stories next weekend on Saturday and Sunday. I hope your weekend has been absolutely fabulous and you have managed to get some good quality crafty time in. Um, there will, of course, be more mayhem and madness here at Madness Manfers Makes for the week coming. Um, thank you so much for coming back time after time. I really do appreciate it. So until I see you again, stay safe, be kind, look after one another, get some good quality time in with your loved ones and get some good quality crafty time in. And I will see you in the next one or around the YouTube streets. Love you guys. Bye.